what Nadia has proposed to do and has been working on already. She graduated from Barnard in 2013 with her um, bachelor's in environmental, sci environmental studies aha, and human rights. Right. Um, and then she did some work out there, working in the real world. She worked for the Parks and Rec Recreational Office in uh, New York City. She did sort of the, there's some, there's some chairs up here, some pond restoration and um, health, I guess you could say, with algae blooms. She also, in her free time, worked for Gen Space, did a little bit of synthetic biology, DNA genetic work, right? And then she came here in 2017, the summer, and started working with me on some Blackfooted ferret hair, um, which she's not going to talk about today, but she's got a lot to talk about. So she's going to go ahead and get started. And uh, Uh, 
due to related individuals um, mating and then causing an increase or decrease of heterogeneity um, and then an increase in potentially deleterious alleles being expressed. So we know that in part this uh, decline in inbreeding depression is caught, this decline in um, successful pregnancy rates is caused by inbreeding depression. But we also happen to know that normal sperm morphology for males um, has been on the decline as well over the past 30 years. So you can see during this first uh, 10 years when ferrets were brought into captivity, they were, they were hovering around 50% normal sperm morphology, but then over the following 20 years, uh, it fell to around 25% normal sperm morphology. And we know that normal sperm production is critical for fertility, they're highly correlated things. Um, and so we know that uh, this decline in normal sperm morphology is in part responsible for the decline in whelping rates that we see. We also happen to know that this change in normal sperm morphology levels coincides with the change in the captive diet. So the captive diet was changed from a rabbit meat based chow to a horse meat based diet, which was changed because the horse meat was commercial and so it helped to standardize the diet for the entire species. But the horse meat based diets really high in polyunsaturated fatty acids or PUFAs and also vitamin A. And both of these things can be really problematic and I'm gonna to talk to you about why very soon. So like I mentioned in the past few slides, normal sperm morphology is really important because it helps to predict fertility. But you may notice that there's no real correlation between these two graphs here. Like you don't see a, a sudden decline in whelping rates following this decline in normal sperm morphology. And so to some people this might indicate that this means that inbreeding depression is inbre increased inbreeding coefficients is really what's driving this uh, decline in whelping rates. But this actually leads me to a larger question that I have which is what exactly is causing this decline in um, infertility? Is it inbreeding depression or is it environmental effects, i.e. diet in our case? And I'd actually like to argue that it's both of these things compounded on one another, which is known as environmental dependent inbreeding depression. And this is when certain deleterious alleles are expressed under certain environmental conditions. And so I'm gonna be talking to you about how um, I hypothesize that diet is causing oxidative stress which is then compounding with inbreeding, which can uh, lead to issues with infertility. My second chapter is gonna talk about how diet may be um, influencing gene expression levels and then how this can be compounded with inbreeding to cause uh, infertility as well. And my last chapter will focus on how uh, inbreeding depression may be compounding with things like environment, so not necessarily diet, but other sort of environmental influences on demography and how this can impact uh, population growth and dynamics. So now let's jump into chapter one. So I'll be focusing on how oxidative stress given from the diet may be causing impacts on sperm morphology, DNA integrity, and then chromatin integrity. So I mentioned to you that normal sperm production is significantly correlated with fertility, and I also showed you this graph of this decline. So now I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about sperm morphology. So on the right hand side here, you'll see this is what a normal sperm looks like. And then on the left hand side, this is a panel of what black footed ferret sperm looks like. So uh, let's walk through this normal sperm. So first it has a head that contains a nucleus, which contains the DNA. And then it has an acrosome, which is a cap that's necessary for penetration into the egg. Next we have a mitochondria or the mid, mid piece, which helps power the tail, which gives energy to the sperm to move forward. And then there's the tail or the flagellum, which helps this, the sperm uh, propel forward in space. And so you'll see that this uh, top left sperm up here highly uh, correlates very well with this uh, normal sperm. So this is what a normal black footed ferret sperm looks like. And then now you'll see all these different types of abnormalities. So the first one that I'll point out are these cytoplasmic droplets. So there's a proximal droplet, which is closer to the head. And then there's a distal droplet, which is more down the tail. And these uh, basically indicate that the sperm is not mature because these cytoplasmic droplets typically drop off during the process of sperm maturation. But here they're retained, which means that these sperm won't be able to successfully fertilize an egg. There's also these bends and coils in the tail, which can impact the ability for sperm to move forward. So you can imagine that the sperm can't really move forward properly and then reach the egg. So these things combined can really cause an impact on the ability for a sperm to fertilize an egg. And we know that um, due to um, my PI, Rachel Santemeyer, and her colleagues recently established that over this 20 year period, there was a significant decline in normal sperm parameters or normal sperm morphology. And that was significantly correlated with this increase in inbreeding coefficients. 
So we know that this decline in normal sperm morphology is in part responsible, um, uh, is in part caused by inbreeding. But we, we also know that inbreeding can't be fully responsible for this. And that's kind of where diet comes in and we have hypothesized that diet is compounding with inbreeding to cause this. And really what our hypothesis is, is that uh, in, um, this change in the captive diet is what has caused this sudden and sustained depression in normal sperm morphology. And even more evidence for this is the fact that wild ferrets that are eating their natural diet actually retained normal levels of sperm morphology. So they're around 50% normal sperm morphology while the captive guys that were eating this captive diet were around 25%. And so we use this normal sperm morphology for them to um, infer that they al are also experiencing regular fertility levels. In addition, we also see that ferrets, captive ferrets that are reintroduced into the wild actually retain low levels of normal sperm morphology, so around 25%, whereas their offspring uh, had higher levels of normal sperm morphology once they were born in the wild. So this could indicate that there's some kind of transgenerational effect going on here, and that's something that we also hope to explore. So oxidative stress is defined as this imbalance between reactive oxygen species, or ROS, and antioxidants. And ROS are these very highly reactive byproducts of aerobic metabolism, and they're pictured right here. And ROS are these, they're known as oxidizers. They basically accept electrons or steal away electrons from other molecules in order to stabilize their outer orbit or in order to reduce their, their own um, outer orbit. And they're really physiologically important because they are involved in most cellular processes, so things like metabolism and also things like cell signaling, cell communication. Um, so yeah, they're really critical for normal cell functioning. Antioxidants, which are made up of things like copper and iron, and also vitamins like vitamin E, vitamin C, collectively make up um, antioxidants, and um, they do exactly as their name says, right? They are the neutralizers of oxidizers. So they act as a buffering system by donating an electron to the ROS. And when there's too much ROS in the body to too little antioxidants, this leads to an imbalance, which can cause deleterious effects, including things like the ROS directly damaging cell membranes, lipids, proteins, and DNA. I mentioned to you guys that the captive diet is very high in vitamin A, and in normal levels, this is actually totally fine because vitamin A can be an antioxidant. By the way, this is what the captive diet looks like. This is horse horse meat meatballs. And um, so vitamin A normally is an antioxidant, but at high levels, it can be pro-oxidative to the cell. So it can cause a mitochondria to leak out more ROS, and it can also be antagonistic to antioxidants. So when there's high levels of ROS, uh, when there's high levels of um, vitamin A intake, there also has to be high levels of antioxidant intake in order to balance that. I mentioned that the diet's very high in PUFAs as well, and the reason why this is problematic is because PUFAs are susceptible to oxidation. And unlike in saturated fatty acids, PUFAs contain this carbon-carbon double bond, which is such a strong bond that it actually weakens the hydrogen atom bonds, and that makes these hydrogen atoms susceptible to being stolen away by ROS. And so when uh, PUFAs steal away ROS, um, sorry, when PUFAs steal away uh, electron from a lipid, this is known as lipid peroxidation. And then this leads to a lipid radical being formed, which then means that this lipid radical needs to steal away uh, an electron from its neighboring lipid in order to stabilize itself. And this leads to a chain reaction, chain reaction which can then lead to this uh, damaged cell membrane, which can be really problematic for the cell, as you can imagine. Another byproduct of lipid peroxidation are these aldehydes, which are these highly reactive byproducts that are known to um, Basically, they can cause protein and DNA adducts, and that can cause DNA damage. You may have noticed that there's this kink where the carbon-carbon double bond occurs, and that's really important because sperm are, have very high levels of PUFAs, particularly because they need to be more fluid in order to penetrate into the cell. So sperm are very high in PUFAs. And we know that diet, uh, a diet high in PUFAs can cause an increase in the PUFA composition in the sperm cell membrane, which can be really useful to help with implantation into the egg. So uh, more PUFAs in the cell membrane means they can penetrate easier. But as you can imagine, if there's higher levels of PUFAs in the sperm cell membrane, 
and then higher levels of vitamin A, which are um, antagonistic to uh, antioxidants, and then higher levels of ROS. This can lead to more lipid peroxidation, which can lead to lots of different problems, like I mentioned, aldehydes, DNA damage, and things like that. So there was a diet study that was done in 2008 um, on the black-footed ferrets, where ferrets, captive ferrets were treated to five different uh, diet treatments. And so, uh, and, and the reason why was because the researchers wanted to see what kind of impact the diet would have on their sperm morphology and also on their fertility levels. So the, the first treatment was a horse meat-based diet, which is, again, these meatballs. Then there was a beef diet. Then there was horse meat plus vitamin E, so an antioxidant. There was horse meat plus um, prey items, so like these poor rats down here, or mice or prairie dogs. And then also horse meat plus vitamin E, uh, or uh, plus a prey item. And this study was really important because it was the one that established the fact that horse meat's very high in vitamin A. And they also found that the ferrets that were only eating um, horse meat had the lowest levels of vitamin E, which shows that there's um, some kind of blockage that vitamin A causes with um, antioxidant uptake. And the researchers also found that the guys that were eating prey items had higher levels of normal sperm parameters. And you can also notice um, that the beef diet was very high as well in normal sperm parameters. And so the, the um, researchers had to decide if they should just change the diet altogether or if they should add prey items to the diet. But they decided to add prey items to the diet because it was uh, good for their psychological enrichment because now they were chewing on bone and also increased their oral health. Um, and it lower their stress levels. So they decided to add prey items to the natural diet now for captive ferrets. And then you probably noticed too that the horse meat based diet and the vitamin E plus horse meat weren't significantly different, which shows that the vitamin E here didn't really add any, any kind of uh, difference to the horse meat based diet. And this may be because there was, uh, this study was done only during one breeding season. So that could have been a limiting factor. And so we're going to do, or we're currently doing another diet study that um, hopefully will make up for some of the um, issues of the last diet study. So this diet study will last for two years and we're having less diet treatments as well. And so the first uh, diet uh, treatment is taking place at Ferret Col um, the Ferret Center Conservation Center in Colorado. Um, and there's a control diet, which is a horse meat plus prey items. Like I mentioned before, the prey items became part of their, their natural diet. And then we have an antioxidant diet, so adding vitamin E to the control. And next we have at Louisville Zoological Gardens in Kentucky, we have the same control diet, but then we have a prey item only diet. So this basically emulates the wild diet. And the offspring will be fed the diet of their mother. And so in, in this diet study, in addition to looking at morphology, we're also gonna be looking at DNA and integrity and chromatin integrity, which they didn't do in the last study. So I mentioned earlier that DNA damage is caused by aldehyde um, damage, uh, aldehydes adducting to DNA, but there's also other factors that contribute to DNA damage, so ROS can directly cause DNA damage. So you can see that this uh, molecule up here is a biomarker of oxidized DNA, and this study showed that there was a, there was a significant correlation, positive correlation between um, this molecule and DNA fragmentation. Also, sperm that have high levels of abnormalities and abnormal morphologies, like we saw, is highly correlated with DNA damage. And also, inbreeding, increased inbreeding coefficients have been shown to be correlated with DNA damage. And also, individuals that have DNA damage issues usually have issues with fertility or sterility. And also, if a female is able to get pregnant with a sperm that has very high levels of DNA damage, this can lead to offspring abnormalities, like um, neurological disorders such as um, autism, and even things like cancers. DNA damage is a really important metric because it's more definitive than morphology for measuring fertility. And the reason why is because there's a, a threshold by which females are able to get pregnant. So in humans, uh, females can't get pregnant if DNA damage is higher than 30% in sperm. And this has also been established for other species as well. So in uh, Cuvier's gazelles, it's 15%, 8% for borgs, and 10 to 20% for bulls. And this is something that I hope to establish in the ferret. But we do happen to have some preliminary evidence that there is indeed DNA damage in ferrets. So this individual, Padalecki, right here, 
um, was able to successfully fertilize a female who also had kids or babies, and his DNA fragmentation index, or his DNA damage level, was at 5.6%. Whereas these two individuals were not able to successfully fertilize a female and they did not have kids. And their DNA damage levels are above 8%. So this makes me think that perhaps the threshold for ferrets is around 8% um, uh, DNA damage level. And so of course we need to look at more males in order to establish if this is actually true, but um, it's an interesting first uh, result. And now in order for you guys to understand more about DNA damage, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit more about some basic biology. So sperm are these very highly specific cells that travel through the female reproductive tract in order to deliver uh, their DNA. And on their way there, they have to fend off oxidizers and mutagens and nucleases. And finally, they're able to deliver it successfully. And the reason they're able to do this is because sperm is very highly compacted. Their DNA is very, very highly compacted. So the way that it works in um, somatic cells is that uh, histones wound DNA and then they come together to form nucleosomes, and the nucleosomes uh, make up chromosomes. But in sperm, 90 to 99% of these histones, based on the species, are replaced by protamines, which are these uh, molecules that are half the size of histones, but are able to wound DNA 20 times as tightly. And then all mammals have uh, protamine one, but then uh, many other mammals have uh, second protamine, and, um, and but they, they basically do the same thing. But essentially, this, uh, transition to protamines allows the DNA in sperm to be extra protected from those kinds of um, oxidizing agents. But there are times when this ratio is thrown off. So there's a histone protamine ratio supposed to be 90, 90, 90 to 99% replaced, right? But sometimes this ratio just uh, is aberrant. And this can lead to a lot of issues. So when there's histone protamine ratio is thrown off, this can uh, lead to abnormalities with sperm morphology, also infertility, and is highly correlated with DNA damage. And the mechanism behind how this happens is not fully understood, but um, there was a study that showed that um, when there's uh, one mutation in a single allele in either protamine one or protamine two, this can cause infertility in mice. So this may be related to a mutation. Going back to this idea of environmental dependent inbreeding, in, inbreeding depression, where certain uh, deleterious alleles are expressed only under certain environmental conditions, um, I actually hypothesize that what if there's something like this going on in the ferret, where we have a histone or protamine mutation, and then um, this means that DNA is now not as tightly wound as it should be, and because it's not as tightly wound, it becomes vulnerable. It becomes vulnerable to being attacked by oxidizing agents. And so this oxidative stress-inducing diet is potentially causing damage to that vulnerable DNA, leading to the symptoms that we see and leading to infertility. Whereas in the wild diet, they're not having oxidized, you know, their, their diet is not, in, in, in oxid, um, their diet is not uh, stress-inducing, and so perhaps they're not, it's not attacking the vulnerable DNA in the same way. So to summarize this hypothesis, this increase in oxidative stress caused by the diet is leading to increased levels of lipid peroxidation, increased levels of DNA damage, and then this all leads to a decrease in fertility. So my methods are that I'm going to be testing um, oxidative stress levels across my four different diet treatments. So I have a control, the antioxidant diet, the wild diet, and then also wild ferrets. I'll also be looking at DNA fragmentation index across the four different diet treatments and also histone and protamine ratios across the four different diet treatments as well. So the way that we collect uh, samples is that we go into the field and we um, electroejaculate ferrets, and then I uh, treat these different samples with, uh, with different types of methodologies in order to freeze them and save them for the future, uh, for depending on what type of analysis I want to run on it. And these are just some anesthetized ferrets. So the first method I'll talk about is the TAC assay total antioxidant capacity, and it's a really good proxy for stress, uh, for oxidative stress, because basically what you do is you add an oxidizing agent to your sample, and then your sample's antioxidants will um, reduce that agent, and so depending on how dark the sample is, that means that there's more antioxidant capacity in that specific sample, and then you can read that on um, the absorbency on the spectrophotometer, and it will tell you that the tech. 
I'll also be doing two different types of assays for DNA damage. First, there's a sperm chromatin structure assay, which measures DNA damage using a laser, um, and this basically characterizes how much DNA damage there is in your entire sample. Um, and then comet assays look at uh, DNA damage in a single individual cell. And so the way that it works is your sample is embedded in agarose, and then the cell is lysed, and then you run this sample on a gel, and then the DNA, the fragmented DNA uh, migrates towards the anode, and then you'll have fragments, you'll have this tail of uh, the DNA fragments. And so the length and intensity is proportional to how much DNA damage there is in that cell. And then lastly, I'll be running histone protamine ratios so, um, and on Western blocks. And so the way that this will work is I'll run the gels to get at the different protein sizes, and then we will um, use antibodies to bind onto specific proteins, which can then quantify how much uh, of certain histone and protamine there is in the sample. So I will be running some non-parametric tests in order to determine the significant differences across the different diet studies and the different metrics that I'm looking at. And, oops, and then I'll also be running a general linear mix models in order to determine uh, what types of parameters are influencing fertility. And so some of my expectations are that uh, the histone and protamine ratios will be the same for the uh, captive and wild ferrets because they all descended from the same individuals. And my hypothesis is that the oxidative stress-inducing diet is what's causing the, the infertility symptoms that we see. So they, these should be the same. I also hypothesize that um, the diet will be, uh, in the diet treatments, antioxidant levels will be higher. And then in the diet treatments, like the antioxidant and wild diets uh, will have lower levels of DNA damage, and I hypothesize that fertility should increase in the diet treatments. So now we can jump into chapter two, which will focus on transcriptomics, and I'm going to be looking at gene regulation by epigenetic modifications and then measuring RNAs to understand phenotype. My first chapter hypothesized that uh, this diet is oxidative stress inducing and so it's causing oxidative stress which lowers these normal sperm morphology parameters that we see. But my second chapter is going to focus on how this oxidative stress inducing diet can be, t can be potentially causing differential transcription in the, um, in the genes and uh, this may impact, impact fertility as well. We all know the central dogma of biology which, which says that DNA is transcribed into RNA. RNA is then translated into um, proteins, and then proteins in a simple sense impact phenotypes. And we also know that each of our cells contains the same exact genetic code, and the reason why we have such a plethora of different cell types is because of this first step, this, trans this, diff this differential transcription across all the different cell types, and that's what gives us all of these. And so transcription is regulated by a complex number of factors, including things like underlying genetic structure, regulatory protein interactions, chromatin structure, transcription factor changes, and also epigenetic modifications. So epigenetics is defined as basically molecular factors and um, epigenetic or, or modifications that are made to, to the genome and around the genome that potentially impact um, the expression of genes. And diet has been shown to significantly impact epigenetic modifications because diet can act on the enzymes that are responsible for adding or removing modifications. And it's also been shown that um, epigenetic modifications can be inherited, and the mechanisms behind this are also um, still being explored, but there's a lot of evidence in the literature for it. So this study in 2013 was published in Nature, and it's a really cool example of how these epigenetic effects take place in mice. So this is how it was set up where we have male mice, uh, or we had pregnant females that were fed folate deficient diets, and then their male offspring were continued on that folate deficient diet for uh, after, after being born and then into adulthood. And folate is important because it's a, a B vitamin, and B vitamins are known to donate methyl groups, or they're known to act on enzymes that, are, uh, that donate methyl groups. And uh, DNA methylation is a type of epigenetic modification. So it's when a methyl group is added to a cytosine directly on DNA, and this is typically associated with a downregulation of a gene or a turning off of a gene. And so what these researchers found was that there was a differential sperm methylation in certain develop key developmental genes. So on the right-hand side, I show some of what these developmental genes are. 
Um, and then I uh, put in red that uh, reproductive developmental processes and regulation of muscle development. Um, so they had that differential sperm methylation. And then they also happened to have, a, a, the folate deficient guys had a decrease in their ability to fertilize females. So they were fertilized, fertilizing females around 50% of the time. And then uh, folate sufficient males were fertilizing them around 80% uh, of the time. And then there was also an increase in offspring abnormalities in the folate deficient guys. Um, they had both skeletal and muscular defects. And so this study shows that impacts, uh, that epigenetics can uh, significantly impact phenotype where we saw this decrease in fertility due to this uh, potential um, uh, decrease in methylation. And then we also saw that there's a potential transgenerational effect here where these key developmental genes may have impacted the ability for the uh, uh, bones and muscles to properly form in the offspring. And so this makes me think about whether something like this may be happening in the ferret, where we have a certain phenotype change, potentially due to this change in diet. So I, so given that um, epigenetic modifications can significantly impact transcription, and given that transcription can impact phenotype, this make, makes me think about whether there is even a mutation to begin with. So instead of there being a histone protamine mutation, perhaps this gene is actually intact, and instead, we have a cap the captive diet, which is causing some kind of epigenetic modifications to be thrown off, which then lead to a transcriptional dysregulation, effectively leading to all the same symptoms that we see of, of, of infertility. And then what if lipid peroxidation isn't the only culprit? What if um, we have some kind of epigenetic modifications that are causing these transcriptional dysregulation, and that's throwing off maybe proteins that are important for the process of sperm maturation? And then that's leading to abnormal sperm morphology levels, which leads to infertility as well. And I want to just uh, be clear that inbreeding is still at play here, given that these guys are all very inbred and given that there's many different uh, factors that contribute to transcription. Also, if you remember back to this graph, we have these reintroduced ferrets that retain these low levels of normal sperm morphology. But given that they're eating the wild diet, perhaps, um, them eating the wild diet caused like an epigenetic modification to take place in their sperm. And even though that epigenetic modification may not have positively impacted their own, their own sperm morphology, it, fertilizing a female with that sperm that now has those modifications may have contributed to this increase in normal sperm morphology in the offspring. And then also these wild born offspring were in utero in wild females that were eating a wild diet. So it's possible that while the female is eating a wild diet that could cause other epigenetic modifications to take place in, that, uh, in the sperm of those offspring, which can then lead to this increase in normal sperm morphology. So I hypothesize due to this diet change, um, epigenetics effects may be at play here, but given that there are many different things that contribute to transcription, um, I will be looking at total RNA transcription and this can account for all the other factors that contribute to transcription as well as epigenetic modifications. And this can then tell us about how genes are differentially regulated and how this may contribute to the phenotypes that we see. There are thousands of types of RNA species found in sperm, um, albeit a thousand times less than in somatic cells, at least in humans. So there are both coding and non-coding RNAs. So things like messenger RNAs, which are translated into proteins, which then impact fertility. And then there's also lots of non-coding RNAs, like microRNAs, which are known, as, uh, known to modify uh, gene expression. So they're actually epigenetic modifiers as well. And many of these have been shown to contribute to things, to really important processes like sperm maturation, fertilization capacity, embryo development, and offspring phenotype. So they have been shown to be significant to be significant and important. A really good example of this is this study that was done in 2006 across these four different species um, that basically show that there are certain sperm um, messenger RNAs that code for proteins once they enter the female reproductive tract that are important for sperm capacitation, which is the set of physiological changes that takes place in the acrosome that allows the sperm to properly penetrate into the egg. So without these sperm um, messenger RNAs, it would, this process of sperm capacitation and fertility ability would not uh, happen properly. So they're, they're pretty critical for this process. So what I'll be doing in this uh, chapter is I'll be looking at differential expression between 
the different diet treatments and then hopefully see if there's some kind of differences that we can find uh, between fertile and infertile individuals. And the way that I'll be doing this is uh, by running RNA-seq. And so I'll be running through the RNA-seq protocol. And then I will also be uh, 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 aligning the transcriptome uh, to the black of ferret genome, which is currently being assembled. And this is just some fake data to show kind of how it could potentially look when we have our, our four different um, diet treatments and then the differential expression across them. And so what I'll be doing is looking at the different kind of uh, differences, that we, significant differences that we see in, across the genome uh, using ANOVAs, and then I will look at which genes are enriched. And conservatively, I hypothesize that we might see genes enriched in um, things like metabolism, antioxidant regulation, uh, sperm maturation, and maybe sperm capacitation, so things that are related to fertilization capacity. So now I'll be uh, focusing on my last chapter, where I will be talking about determination, uh, ter determining population viability and strategies to minimize extinction risk. So we need to stay, take a step back from you know, all these different hypotheses that we're talking about to ask some larger questions about the ferret. Will the ferrets always have to be captively managed? Will wild populations always have to be supplemented? Will these populations ever be able to be independent without supplementation? And will the captive population even subsist to supplement, to continue to supplement uh, ferrets into the wild? Or are they at risk of extinction? Are there any types of management strategies that can potentially maximize their survival? So population viability, or the ability for a population to subsist into the future, is determined by two major factors, deterministic and stochastic factors. So deterministic factors, or threats, are those that, given a, a set of initial um, conditions, has an exact outcome. And anthropogenic forces are typically determined to be um, deterministic threats. So things like the destruction of the prairie habitat would be a deterministic threat. And stochastic threats, uh, given a set of initial conditions, have an ensemble of different potential outcomes, and there are many different examples of this. So there's uh, demographic and environmental stochasticity, such as not being able to predict uh, the, the sex ratio of the next generation. So the dusky seaside sparrow was a very endangered bird, and when the last six individuals were born as males, this population was determined to be extinct. There's also catastrophes, so things like environmental catastrophes like hurricanes, but also uh, disease outbreaks like the sylvatic plague with the ferret and the prairie dog. Genetic stochasticity, so things like individuals inbreeding with each other, and then also genetic drift. Um, so these things then compound on one another and entrap a small population in what is known as the extinction vortex. So we have these deterministic threats up here, and then these stochastic threats here, and then this just continues to reduce the population size and it can lead to extinction. Population viability analysis, or PVA, is a set of methods that helps to determine the extinction risk for a certain species or population. And there are a lot of different approaches to this. Analytical models have some limitations because they are notoriously difficult to solve, and the nonlinear dynamics of population growth uh, add to the difficulty of um, incorporating that into an analytical model. And then also analytical models have to make large assumptions in order to be solved. Uh, and they can only include a certain number of parameters. And so those assumptions may not necessarily be true for uh, the species and, and may not properly reflect reality in the way that other models can. And then in traditional population modeling, there is typically, uh, it's a typically assumed that females drive the population growth dynamics, but this may not necessarily be true for, uh, for species that have an important male co um, behavioral component. Simulation models, are, on the other hand, are actually really good for uh, PVA because they can incorporate many different factors, things like genetic factors, uh, environmental, um, and demographic, and you can basically simulate your population over the next several years, and then this can help determine the extinction risk for the population. 
So Vortex is a PBA software that is an individual-based simulation program. It's actually developed by a committee member of mine, Bob Lisi, and it's regularly used in the conservation world, so it's regularly used by the International Union for Conservation of Nature. And the way that it works is your population is input into the program, and then your population walks through these different population processes, which are modeled as discrete sequential events, and each of these occurs with a different probability distribution. And each of these different population uh, parameters, or each of these different population processes has different parameters that you use, uh, that you inform with, give with your own data. So for example, in reproduction, using your data, you would determine what age classes are reproducing at what rates, or what uh, age classes are dying at what rates. And so your data informs this, and then it helps you to, uh, to put this into the vortex model, and then you iterate it over and over again, and this will lead to a probability of extinction for your, your species. And so I've done a little bit of this. I've looked at some of, I've tried to establish some demographic trends in the black-footed ferret, and hopefully I'll be able to use these to parameterize my models. And so here you can see that uh, one example of this is that over the past 20 years, the percent of dams whose entire litter survived is increasing substantially. Also, we see that the number of kits per female is increasing as the years go by as well, so females are having more kits in their litters. And then also we see that uh, larger litters are surviving more. So all of these different trends can kind of um, show that the black-footed ferret is adjusting to or adapting to captivity, but it can also show that management is potentially getting better. Uh, and these are all some, you know, these are interesting findings and hopefully I'll be able to use these to parameterize my models. And so my goals are to establish the current population viability of captive ferrets right now. So I mentioned wild ferrets, but wild dynamics are a lot more complicated and I think it's important to establish first whether, what the dynamics are in the source population which are these captive ferrets. So I'll be focusing on the captive ferrets. And um, so I'll be looking at the current population viability of, of them using demography right now. <coughs> And then I'll be modeling various different uh, management strategies to um, see if there's a way to maximize their um, survival. And then I'll hopefully be able to incorporate some of the reproductive trends that I established in my past few chapters in order to see if that can potentially impact uh, the long-term viability of the population. So to summarize everything that I've just went over, <coughs> My first chapter talked about how oxidative stress may be, um, how the diet causing oxidative stress may be reducing sperm quality. And I also talked about how epigenetic modifications compounding with other things that impact transcription uh, may be impacting fertility as well. And then lastly, I talked about how population modeling can potentially help with projections about the ferret's future. So why study the ferret in the first place? Um, first of all, the black-footed ferret is one of the most endangered mammals in the world. And while this is really sad, it gives us a really important opportunity to use them as a model organism for understanding things like inbreeding depression. And this can help us with managing other species that are potentially threatened, um, but maybe not as threatened as the black-footed ferret. And then also, by studying the ferret, this can actually lead to answers that we can implement in the field. So if our research is able to lead to management changes that can help the survival of the species, then that seems worth it. I also mentioned earlier that the black-footed ferret is an indicator species for prairies. And so, like I mentioned, uh, uh, prairie dogs are these ecosystem engineers and, and black-footed ferrets rely on them so tightly. And without these guys, the prairie ecosystem is just, uh, it, it can't function properly. And prairie ecosystems are an important natural resource for humans because they act as carbon sinks as well as they absorb water runoff. And so by studying species and restoring species to prairies, we're actually just helping ourselves uh, with uh, the proper management of a natural resource. So we all know that species are going extinct at a rate that is much faster than is natural. Um, the recent UN assessment said that like oh, a million species are going to go extinct if nothing drastic is done. And uh, all
all of these different species pictured here, along with thousands of other species, have really unique evolutionary histories. And by losing out on these different species, we're losing out on our ability to uh, learn about the uh, history of life. And so by studying the black-footed ferret um, and looking at how inbreeding is potentially compounding with things like transgenerational epigenetic inheritance, we can learn about the consequences of this maladaptive phenotype on fitness and how this can impact uh, not only the ferret but other species that are experiencing similar things um, in this era of the Anthropocene. And hopefully we can keep the black-footed ferret from being added to this list of extinct species. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge many different people and places. So um, the IMSD program for funding my first two years here at UChicago. Um, the CEB Heinz Fund for allowing me to do my uh, two uh, seasons of field work so far. The Diversity Fund for uh, giving me money to do experiments. Uh, Lincoln Park Zoo for giving me a lab. And then my committee members, of course, Rachel for all her support and the committee members. Um, my lab at the zoo, which is amazing and uh, just give me friendship and a sense of community. And then so many friends and cohort members uh, and everyone at, in the Darwin Inc and my family. Thank you. <laughs> challenges the funding and support of this mm -hmm. work. I have to ask the so what yeah. character. Yeah. You know, what have you any predictions about alternative strategies, mm -hmm. potential impact? Are there other ferrets around that could be introduced to replace? Mm -hmm. I think that's totally reasonable. I'm, I think a lot of people think like that. I mean a lot of money goes into managing these like very small population. And like you said, they're not uh, keystone species themselves, right? Prairie dogs have other uh, carnivores that can eat them. Like, it's not like the, the ferrets are necessarily necessary for the maintenance of prairie ecosystems. Um, but I think, I, I know that there are different ideas that are being thrown out there for uh, Im improving the ferrets' chances. So there's like a, some of the, uh, what is it called? The um, rewilding guys that are potentially thinking about like, uh, enhancing the genome by adding some other uh, genes, maybe from like the European polecat, um, to the to the ferret, uh, to, in order to increase their, you know, uh, potential for like, you know, the, the increase in population size. But um, I don't think that other ferrets can be re reintroduced in order to take their place because they evolved, right, specifically to eat prairie dogs and they're very niche and there are no other ferret species that are that niche in the same way. So if they go extinct, then uh, it's, it'll be us losing out on a lot of things that we can learn about, but I don't think it's going to destroy the, uh, the prairie ecosystem. But what's the sister species of prairie dog? Oh, uh, not prairie dog, sorry. Black footed ferrets. ferrets. I think yeah. the European polecat is the one that's the most uh, related. But domesticated ferrets are not actually.